for humanity, Armageddon, or a whole new exciting world? Welcome to Business Without Barriers, the show bringing you relevant strategies to thrive and succeed in a volatile world, and the show turning barriers into bridges by bringing humanity back to business. I'm your host, Carmen Wild, and opening up his successful today is David Hull. David is a futurist, thought leader, and global keynote speaker. In the last 14 years, he's delivered over 1,200 presentations and keynotes on six continents and 16 countries. He's often called the CEO's futurist, having spoken to or advised over 4,000 CEOs and business owners. He writes the highly regarded futurist blog, Evolution Shift, and has authored nine books. He's the futurist in residence at the Ringing, Ringling College of Art and Design, the co-founder and managing director of the Sarasota Institute, a 21st century think tank, and the honorary futurist at the Future Business School of China. David also spent more than 20 years in media and entertainment, having worked at NBC, CBS, and was part of the senior executive team that created it and launched MTV, Nickelodeon, VH1, and CNN Headline News. He's won two Emmys and was nominated for an Academy Award. A very, very warm welcome to you, David. It's so awesome to have you on the show today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Carmen, truly. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, and what a bio. So let's start off with the media days. Could you share one of your fondest memories that pops to mind from the media and entertainment days? Well, there's so many of them. Um, I think I think a lot of, the, you know, uh, launching MTV, I was part of the team that created it before it launched. And it was really a ride, as, as you could imagine. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing was at the time, in the United States, and uh, only 10% of the country had cable, only 10% of the households, so it couldn't really be seen. Um, so we launched this dynamic program and, and a channel and video music, and there'd never been a video music channel before. And what was so interesting was, you know, for me, and it was really good to is a is a kind of a forerunner to being a futurist i had to sell something that people couldn't see uh -huh. right and and so i was selling them on a concept that they couldn't see and they bought it right so it was kind of selling people persuading people to invest spend money buy on something that didn't exist to them and it was really interesting and then finally when it when it got distribution, it was just an explosion. I mean, I, I would walk in and give talks, you know, and there'd be 500 people to listen to me. And I knew it wasn't because of me. It was because I was <laughs> vice president of sales or MTV. But, but nevertheless, it was a cultural phenomenon. It's always fun and exhilarating and informative to be part of a, uh, a cultural phenomenon. Ah, oh, what a beautiful part of your um former years and 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 I mean you continue to see how they've taken it since since you've left and um yeah how it's transitioned into the future which which was really interesting so how did you make this transition then into being a futurist how, how did that come about well Carmen all my life I did things that people hadn't done before right so I was living slightly ahead of the curve you know, when I got out of college, all I wanted to do was to buy a van and live in it. And I did that for a year. And people said, well, that's nuts. And then a few years later, everyone was living in vans, right? And then uh, a few years later, when, <laughs> when people started living in vans, I was backpacking overland across Asia. And, oh, that's stupid. Why would you ever do that, right? You could buy a house with that money. And then the MTV situation, I was the number one sales guy at, M at CBS, the number one network at the time in the United States. And I took a 50% pay cut because I figured, hey, rock and roll TV, and we also you know, helped launch CNN, 24-hour news channel, how could this not work, right? And in the late 90s, I was the managing director of a dot-com um, that created some of the first online courses. So again, 
doing things that people said wouldn't work. And then finally, in this century, I was giving a speech at Berkeley and it was, it was one of those moments that changes a life because I was standing in front of about 70 PhDs, the people who oversaw the California uh, university system of uh, education and technology, which was my sweet spot at the time. And I was for did a 20 minute talk and for 45 minutes, I had them in the palm of my hand and I was, <laughs> in a meditative, totally present state. It was kind of like I was in the zone, right? So I witnessed it and I said, what is this? What is this that I'm doing? Because it feels so good. It feels so me. I want to do this for the rest of my life. And the witnessing was I was being a catalyst to get people to think about the future and then to facilitate a conversation about it. And that's how I've defined myself as a futurist ever since. So I came back from that a speech and uh, started my blog and, and started rereading the great future said read and some science fiction and uh, wrote my first book in 2007 and it's been full time ever since. Wow, what, a, what an amazing way of creating the future for yourself and um, doing actually what you've been doing all along you just didn't call it uh, being a futurist. Right, right. Yeah. You believe, so I see you've got your banner at the back that the 2020s, the most disruptive decade in history is what you believe we're headed for. And that we face decisions that will determine the path of human civilization in this century and beyond. What scares you most about this decade? Nothing oh, um, scares me um, that we don't, that we, whenever I use, Carmen, whenever I use the pronoun we, I'm talking about humanity, unless I say otherwise. So uh, the only fear I have is that we do not um, step up to the real opportunity we have to create uh, a new future for humanity. Um, I mean, that's where we are. And so, um, you know, the 2020s is really uh, this decade, there'll be more change than any two to three decades in history. And all the trends are kind of coming together simultaneously. And we know we talk about those, but, but uh, so this is really the time. It, it, it's almost specious to talk about the 2030s or 2040s because what we do and what happens and how we navigate this decade is gonna set the trajectory of humanity, at least to 2050, if not for the whole century. So this is one of those moments, historic moments in time where um, the direction of evolution um, will shift one way or the other. Mm. So given what, having read some of, of, of just a tiny bit of your work because David, I mean, I'd, I'd love to have another conversation with you in terms of how on earth you manage your time to pump out what you do, but we'll leave that for a different show. Right. Having read just a little bit of your work, there's so much what other people may look at as really scary stuff coming. So I, I, I love the optimism with which you answered that question. And we'll come back to the we side of it and the criticality of that a little later. So let's go to the, the converse of that then. So what excites you about what's, what we have ahead of us? Well, uh, as a futurist, I think in macro trends and history and, and you know, huge dynamics. So the way to set up the answer to that is, um, you know, my first book was called The Shift Age, and I'm known for saying we've left the information age and entered the shift age. And without going into all those details, I came with, with this realization 2005, 2006, after that, you know, experience. And what I realized was having read, you know, the great futures of the last hundred years and, and a lot of science fiction and a student of history, I realized that, that we were entering in this new millennium, in this new century, a whole new potential reality or next stage of human evolution. So the shift age uh, is from roughly the middle part of the first decade of this century, say 2005, probably through to 2030, maybe a little beyond. And the reason I called it that in general is that this is the time where humanity is going to make the transitional shift 
from reality as it was up to 2000 to the reality that we're going to collectively be living in the 2030s. So what excites me is to be present at a time and to be able to hopefully influence as a futurist, as I can see these things, um, helping humanity, helping humanity move to the next evolutionary step. I mean, the name of the blog, which is, as I said, the first thing I started is evolution shift. So I believe that humanity is, is now at the threshold of an evolutionary shift in terms of how we live, how we think of ourselves, our consciousness, how we relate to each other, you know, finding the necessary regenerative uh, balance uh, to stay on this planet because we we're, you know, we're destroying it. And so uh, it's really a great time. I mean, it's one of those moments where uh, everything can go one way or can go another way. So why not be of those moments where one could have an effect? So I'm really excited about and, and that's one of the reasons I'm writing a series of books in the 2020s, because I feel it's the most important books I can write, because it's almost like practical travel guides to help people and organizations navigate this fork in the road, this precious time we have. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. So let's delve a little bit. You've, you've spoken now of the, the shift age that you've, you've referred to. Um, this tra transformation space that we're in. Can you explain, you speak about three forces of the shift age. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly explain to us your thinking around the flow to global, the flow to individual, and then the ele electronic connect connectedness of humanity? Sure. So, you know, every age has its own characteristics. And so when I came up with the, the concept of the shift age, I had to find the characteristics. And the fewer the characteristics, the better they are because you, you have to simplify the truth. Mm -hmm. So the three forces, as you said, the flow to global, meaning this is the time that we're getting reorganized in a global way. Obviously, the, you know, the global economy, but it's also the word we use. I mean, it, you know, uh, 20 years ago, we would have said foreign, overseas, international, and now we say global. So it's this construct in our mind. But the most important thing, as I've alluded to, is that we've entered the um, global stage of human evolution. We've gone from family to tribe to village to city to city state to nation state, and our only remaining boundaries for now are planetary. And all the major issues facing humanity are planetary in scope. So that means that we have to elevate ourselves out of the historical past of being parts of religions or being parts of nation states or, you know, having a lot of us, them moving to a collective we. So this is, you know, we navigate this well. We don't destroy ourselves and the planet with us. Um, you know, in 100 to 200 years, this moment is going to be looked back on as the next evolutionary step. So the flow to global is that. The flow to the individual has happened. I mean, I know you you lived in in uh, South Africa before where you live now, and 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 in the in the Western cultures in the in the industrial age and the information age, the the developed countries had an explosion of choice, right? I mean, when I was growing up in a big town and a big city in the United States in the fifties and sixties, there were five channels, right? And now there's a limit, unlimited amount of cable channels and an, and an infinite amount of streaming channels and everything else. So when there's an explosion of choice, the power moves from the producer to the consumer, from the institution to the individual. So at the same time we're getting organized around all of us, we're getting organized around the power of the individual. And both of those forces are amplified by the accelerating electronic connectedness of the planet. And the way to describe the accelerating electronic connectedness of the planet is best with the mobile devices. Um, you know, if I were to call my wife in another part of the house, maybe 50 feet away, you know, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, five seconds her phone would ring. And if I call the guy who used to book me into China, maybe another 15,000 miles, another two seconds because of the relay of the satellite. Mm -hmm. So the difference between 50 feet and 15,000 miles is two seconds. So there's no time or distance limiting human communication. You could not say that 15 years ago. And then, of course, if I talk to you on the cell phone, one of the things I say after how you doing or 
uh, can you hear me okay, is where are you, right? So there's no time, distance, or place limiting human communication. That is the first time that could ever be said. And the other point is that there's, there is, there's the same number of cell phones as there are people on the planet. If you take 18-year-olds and up, there's cell phone ubiquity. So we've created two realities with the electronic connectedness. The reality we used to live in and still do, the physical reality based on atoms and the screen reality based on digits. And you know, you know from what you do that, that the screen reality is where the future shows up, right? I mean, why is physical retail getting destroyed around in the United States at least is because of amazon.com or Airbnb or Uber. So the platforms are, are destroying the physical reality. So we are in a stage where we're moving to a new reality that's technologically oriented and based where we're, we're going to have a new consciousness and where we have to think about ourselves as a species, not as subsets of that. Mm. So given that some of that context that you've given us there, what's the danger of people not being aware of these shifts, of sort of being stuck in the legacy thinking, clinging to the past, even hoping that this COVID thing will blow over, for instance, and we'll just miraculously move back to normal, whatever normal may be mean to people, What's the grave danger that we don't make this move to thinking of ourselves as a species and people are still in these pockets of hoping for the past? Well, the same thing will always happen if, if, if humans don't evolve, you know, death and destruction. You know, I mean, um, uh, I just did a, my fifth uh, TEDx talk um, in February and it was a virtual one. And basically, um, you know, the title of it was Saving Ourselves from Ourselves. And uh, as somebody who's, you know, set up a global nonprofit to face climate, the climate crisis and written two books on it, I've always been angry about this self save the planet, right? I mean, you know, help sign this petition, help save the planet, or even worse, you check into a hotel and, you know, you go into the bathroom or your hotel room and it says, please help us save the planet by not doing your laundry, right? So, I mean, so save the planet means nothing. It's stupid. The planet has been around for three and a half billion years, be around for three and a half more billion years. So, you know, saving the planet sounds overwhelming. So, oh, gee, how can we do it? And it's so anthropocentric. You know, Carmen, the way, to, the way to face climate change is we have to save ourselves from ourselves because we have created this climate crisis. So we, if, if we've created it by saying save ourselves from ourselves, it implies that we can solve it, right? So, so what we have to do is we, the, the people that aren't going to get that are the people that are lost, in, as you say, in their legacy thinking of their individual lives. They, you know, it, it, there is so much, there's so much uh, metaphysical writing and actual writing and, and dynamics that we've entered a new age and a new stage and a new level of consciousness. So, I guess the risk is everything, right? I mean, uh, it, death and destruction. Um, if we don't do the significant heavy lifting between now and 2030 on the climate crisis, there won't be civilization as we know it by 2100. So, I mean, we are at this fork in the road. We are at this moment in time where we can, our destiny is in our hands but we have to get there collectively and we have to, we have to do what we can. So, you know, at this stage in my career, I've, I've, you know, I'm still writing a lot of books and giving talks, but primarily virtually now setting up a green screen studio. So I've got kind of a spaceship uh, enterprise coming out of my house. So I don't have to travel because, you know, one of the things I, I, I say is, is uh, I'll, I'll speak for less, rather than you have flying me to a place and taking up two or three days of my time. But also, you know, sitting here in Florida, if I were to fly to Vegas and back, which is a logical place to give a speech, that's three tons of CO2 that I am not putting into the atmosphere on behalf of that conference, right? So, so everything has to change. So what COVID has done is, is really, ex COVID, in one year has brought has accelerated about five years worth of change, which is why 
it's such um, an opportunity to take what's happened with COVID and apply it going forward. So corporations are becoming more and more aware of the, the climate change and the, the, the effects. And you know, they, they probably will be more and more regulated going forward. But how does this cascade? If each individual needs to become aware of the fact that they're part of a species, and that we all need to play a part in what's looming ahead of us, and that we can actually make this shift into something quite exciting. How do we do it, David? How you know, is it through these conversations? But are we doing enough quickly enough? No, we're not doing it quickly enough. Mm. That's that's the whole point. I mean, that's that's why I'm you know spend a lot of time writing and talking and creating movements and stuff because I feel that that's my highest my highest value, right? Mm. So we're not moving quickly enough. Uh, we're, we're just not. Um, and in, in terms of climate, we're not. In terms of artificial intelligence, we're not. In terms of genetic engineering, we're not. In terms of reinventing capitalism and democracy, we're not. And those are the things that I'm focusing on. Um, the first thing you have to do is you have to make people aware. The second thing you have to do is you have to make them understand. And this is this is so simple once you get it, but so many people are scared of change. And the fundamental um, lunacy of that is that the only constant in the universe is change, right? There's, no, there's nothing that's fixed. Everything is in a rate of change. We may not be able to perceive it, but everything is vibrating at a rate of change. So, so, um, if you are resistant to change, your life is going to be one struggle because the only cons, if, if there wasn't change, there wouldn't be time, right? And so time, with time, there's change. So, so everything is changing. And, and so the beauty for me as a futurist with, with COVID is simply that before COVID, I'd always have to say, you know, audience or please suspend what you think reality is because reality changes. People seem to think, no, reality is always the same. I get up, I do the same thing. I go to the same place, blah, blah, blah. And so with COVID, you know, I, I've been able to say the companies I've advised, um, you know, say, you know, well, the reality you thought you were coming into in January 2020 wasn't the reality three months later, was it? So, so you have to admit that the reality has changed. And so people now, now see that. And so so instead of trying to push back, kind of going, reality is not going to change, since the reality has changed for them, it's much easier. For, they will then say, so how do I navigate it? Or what is this going to mean? Or what is this going to look like? So, so once you put people in a, in a state of cognitive dissonance, which is the title of the second book of this series, you know, cognitive dissonance that what I thought reality doesn't exist, or the reality I want to believe in is no longer the one I can obviously believe in then they're open to change. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, I, I wrote a column and it's the, it's, the, it's the title of the second chapter of the second book that's about ready to get published within the week, which is, you know, COVID-19 is a bicycle with training wheels for the 2020s, right? No, so, you know, as a kid or as a parent, bike with training wheels, right? That's what a kid gets on to learn the concept of a bike, to brake, to turn, to understand the traffic flow to ring the bell. And then the training wheels come off and they have to learn balance. So what COVID is doing is it's giving those of us that are adaptive, which is one of the keys here, is, uh, is the ability to, to uh, have balance and move forward. You know, as Einstein says, the one thing about a bicycle is you gotta keep moving, right? So um, that's the metaphor which, which COVID has given us. You know, now that there isn't anybody who has experienced COVID who hasn't had some fundamental disruption to what they thought reality was for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good news is, sorry to keep going on this, but the good news is, is I've involved, been involved in talking with leaders and companies. There's a lot of transformation going on as a result of this. I mean, you take people out of their day to day and their habitual need to respond to their externalities and, you know, they'll end up baking bread, I mean, that's a phenomenon, or, or reading lots of books, or whatever it is, 
you know, and, and there's a whole lot of resistance to going back to the way that it was back to the offices and everything else. And corporations are starting to realize that. So, so COVID for all its death and destruction was a really good opening of the door. Mm-hmm. You know, it started two months into the new decade, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so for a year I've been saying, so how's the decade starting out for you, right? So, so COVID has really kind of ripped us into the place where we are openly experiencing change and therefore considering what the change might look like going forward. Mm. David, you use a, a really clever metaphor where you say if, if structures were viewed as cars, um, <laughs> we get an idea of how fast different structures are moving. And, and you put corporations right on the top where corporations were viewed as cars, they'd be going at 100 miles per hour. But then right at the bottom of the list, you've got um, the political structures that would be seen to be going at three miles per hour and the law at one mile per hour, which is, is frightening. So does that picture give us an idea of how important the corporations are in dry, in helping drive change, if 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 that, yeah, is, I, I mean, mm-hmm. sorry, um, yeah, for about six years, I've been advocating that it's time for <clears throat> national corporations and multinational corporations to stand up and face the common good. From a demographic point of view, they have to do that because the the new waves of generations washing across the planet, the, the, the millennials, you know, born in the last 20 years of the last century and the digital natives born in the last 20 years are c- completely different. They want to make a difference. And so they're going to go work for a place that allows them to be who they are and and hopefully will allow the corporate culture will allow them and the, the company to affect the bottom, the the common good, whatever that is. So, so to keep to get the best and the brightest um, as employees, they're gonna have to do that. But also, um, and there's a current thing that's happening in the United States where there were some very restrictive voting laws passed in the state of um, Georgia. And so Major League Baseball, which is a big sport here in the United States, moved the all-star game out of it, right? So, and and I commended that, but the corporations need to do more than just move from shareholder value to stakeholder value. They actually need to identify and stand up for whatever values are of their corporation that they want to see in the world. You know, it's it's like like Gandhi said, uh, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to do with corporations. I mean, it's not good enough to say, oh, well, we give everybody a paid week's vacation to go work at this charity. No, it's more than that, right? I mean, it, 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 um, corporations is where the money is. And if the money's, you know, the money, money doesn't talk, it screams, right? Mm-hmm. So is the old phrase. So yeah, so corporations need to change. And if, they're all, if the only thing they're interested in is making money, they'll be out of business by the end of the decade. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing a shift in that direction if you compare it to years ago? Say that again. Sorry. Are you seeing the shift in terms of the consciousness on the on the corporation side compared to years ago? Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, they think they're moving a lot, but they're not moving enough. Again, corporations perpetrate the us versus them. Yes. You know, Apple may be. You know, I love Apple. I have an Apple phone. I have two Apple laptops. Um, I think Steve Jobs was a brilliant disruptor. But they've created planned obsolescence. Oh, the iPhone 8 leads to the iPhone 9, leads to the iPhone 10, leads to the iPhone 11. So it is still part of that last century planned obsolescence. And it's kind of like, that's not good enough, right? Um, I'm, you know, I'm writing the third book on this is about the golden age of design and redesign. And, um, <laughs> you know, we don't repair stuff. We throw it away. Right. So we're going to have to move to conscious non-consumption. So how is a corporation going to reinvent itself where growth is a bad thing? Right? <laughs> it's, it's almost impossible for them to do it. 
And until they do it, they're not really, they're not, they're still going to be part of the drag of the legacy thinking. Mm. This, seeing that we're talking about business, you, you mentioned somewhere, and I can't remember exactly, something about given the rate of change, innovation is almost obsolete. Um, yeah. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that statement. Sure. In, I love, I love it. I, I, I love innovation is an out of date word. It's an in, innovation is from the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the simple metaphor is Steve Jobs was not an innovator. Okay. If Steve Jobs was an innovator, we would have had a Blackberry with a bigger screen. That would have been innovation. Take the Blackberry, which, you know, had the actual physical buttons and a very small screen and make it bigger. Instead, he came up with a whole new device. So he came up with a transformational or disruptive device. So in a time of transformation, in a time of disruption, in a time where the speed of change has become environmental, iter innovation is just iterative change, right? So the question isn't, and, and, and the way that came up, you know, funny ways that you have insights, right? So I think it was 2014 and I was given a talk I gave a big talk to like 2,500 people in this big ballroom in Vegas. And then I was walked to the trade show, right? Um, you know, there's always have trade shows. And I, I guess I was going to sign books at a, you know, platinum sponsors booth or something. And as I was being walked to the booth, to their booth, if you've ever been on a trade show, you know, there's lots of booths and people were saying, we provide innovative solutions to, we provide innovation solutions to, we provide innovation solutions to. Well, if everybody's providing innovation solutions, there is no such thing. It's just like, you probably know somebody who says awesome, awesome all the time. Well, if, if everything is awesome, nothing is awesome. Things are good, <laughs> things are nice, things are cool, but they're not all awesome, right? So if everybody is doing innovation, it's irrelevant, right? So innovation is a 90s word, let it go. And I know you speak and your voice is heard in corporations. The question to ask them is what might disrupt you mm. while you're busy trying to innovate? Hmm. So is the new innovation disruption? Uh, I, I, that's your phrase, not mine. Um, <laughs> we, we, we are in a time of disruption and yes. transformation. Yes. Um, you know, innovation was making things better. Mm -hmm. Disruption is completely changing things. Mm -hmm. And the definition of transformation is a change in nature, shape, character, and form. So that's what corporations have to do. They have to change their nature, shape, character, and form. Mm -hmm. they, think of themselves as profit machines. They can't decide that um, um, happiness employees is not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. You know, laying off people creates fear. People don't work well in fear. I mean, what are the two oversimplified, you know, motivators, love and fear. And so, you know, maybe that's a a, a kind of a simplistic way to look at it, but what corporations are operating out of love and what corporations, corporations are operating mm -hmm. out of fear. And to some degree, they're all operating out of both at some level, but universally, they're much more fear-based. If you don't meet these guidelines, mm -hmm. if you don't get your sales up, if you don't, or blah, 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 you're gone, right? I mean, <laughs> that doesn't open up people's deepest feelings of love mm -hmm. and, and creativity. So mm -hmm. that's the other way to think about it is, is um, and again, this is, I, I like to oversimplify things so people get insights. The 20th century was a left brain century, you know, science, math, engineering. The 21st century is the right brain century, creativity, humanity, evolution, transformation. So, so, ways to look at corporations to see if they're doing it. Are they coming more out of love? Or are they coming out of fear? Number one. Number two, are they, are they in the business of transforming themselves? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the reason I made the second book in the 20 trains about cognitive dissonance is, is that CEOs and I've advised, you know, a dozen of them since COVID um, and their companies in some cases is um, are they, 
are they um, adapting to change or are they holding on? Are they understanding that they still have to be measured in the old metrics? The, the, you know, if they're successful, how did they get successful? Because they successfully met some metrics that people say, oh, that makes success. They have to keep doing that. At the same time, there's a whole new reality coming in and they have to learn how to be successful in that. Mm. So, you know, there's a great quote. I, I'm sure you've seen it because I put it everywhere in the stuff I've sent you. You know, it's from Alvin Toffler. You know, um, the illiterate of the 21st century but not be, will not be those that cannot read and write, but those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So a fundamental responsibility of a corporation in the 2020s is how good are you at unlearning how you used to do things? Mm. Really nice, um, like you say, simple insights, David, for us to get our heads around in, in, in terms of corporations and the transformations to, um, to shift into. And, and I, I love the whole idea of love. Yeah, are you operating out of love or fear? That's uh, sure. That's a, a major transformation um, for, for corporations to, to get around. Well, you know, we were chatting before you started recording about COVID, right? And I was, we were talking about COVID, where you are and where I am and getting the vaccine and all that stuff. And if you come out of love, it's like, hey, the vaccine's great. We're going to solve this. We're going to move forward. And if you come out of fears, oh, I don't know about the fact, you know, I don't want to go outside. I don't want to get a vaccine because it may be bad for me. And, and it, it, you know, uh, it, 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 the, only way, the only way we can solve we, humanity, can solve COVID is collectively support each other in getting vaccines, in wearing masks, in doing all the things that science says, right? And, you know, I just wrote a column here, my biweekly column in, in Sarasota, Florida, and I basically called out anti-vaxxers, right? People don't want to get vaccinated. I said, that's fine if you don't want to do it, but don't expect to be allowed to go in certain places. Don't expect to go into certain countries where you have to show proof of vaccination. Don't, don't expect your kids to go to school if they don't get vaccinated. So, you know, you are limiting yourself rather than supporting everyone else. You're isolating yourself because you don't have the right to infect others. Mm. And that's, that's the real transformation coming. So, exactly. Um, yeah. Let's go back, David, and, and talk about your views on the age of intelligence. And sure. again, with, with reference, given that we've got a business audience, if you can speak about this age of intelligence with reference specifically to the impact on the world of work. Um, okay. So, yeah, there's lots of ways to approach it. Starting from that, um, the single... So... Artificial intelligence, and by the way, I like to call it technological intelligence because it's real intelligence. I, uh, in the middle part of the last decade, I realized that artificial intelligence, still calling it that, was accelerating, it was finally taking off. So I looked up the word intelligence in five dictionaries and nowhere was the word human, right? Whales are intelligent, dolphins are intelligent, the universe is intelligent. So why do we call it artificial? Well, because it's a machine, it's not us. Right, which is the same reason we got into the problem with the climate crisis is we're above all the species, we're not one of them, right? So I call it technological intelligence. But technological intelligence is going to eviscerate jobs as we know it. You know, the probably, you know, a, a third of white collar jobs in developed countries around the world will be overtaken by technological intelligence, certainly factories or robotics. So businesses are going to be confronted, governments are going to be confronted with a very oversimplistic choice. Do we look at what is about to happen as, my God, 25, 30% unemployment, or do we realize that technological intelligence is going to free up human potential so that we don't think of ourselves as our identities aren't tied to jobs, they're tied to who we are and what we do. So, so corporations... We're going to are going to end up, you know, I can't think of a corporation coming that isn't going to have this. They're going to have fewer people, more technology, and more training. That's the future of corporations. Fewer people, more technology, and more training. A lot of the training for the new technologies, right? Um, but um, 
I think that the other the other thing that's going to happen is that is that um, what we think jobs are in the sense of being um, very um, uh, what do I want to say uh, brain driven, if you will, or mm-hmm. uh, um, um, ethics driven, all, all that's going to change because, y- you know, uh, think about the fact that when you and I first interacted with computers, we typed on a keyboard. Then, of course, it was the touch screen. Now, of course, there's voice commands, you know, Alexa, Siri. There is the capability now, it will be mainstream in the next four or five years to do brainwave computer interface. So we'll be controlling our computers with our brains. That's a part of the age of intelligence, right? So, so every, you know, our, our, one of the concepts is, is, you know, this, this phone that I'm holding up, this smart device happens to be an iPhone 8. One, it's more powerful than supercomputers in the 70s and 80s. Two, it is handheld. And three, it is, um, it is, takes it, we externalize our minds, right? If, you know, if you write list, you're externalizing your mind, you're taking something out of your mind and putting on a piece of paper. So this is the ultimate externalization of the mind in the sense that my son, his name's Christopher, he lives in Europe. I don't know his phone number. I just press his name, right? I don't need to know his phone number. Extend that so that the age of intelligence means that Right now, we talk about smartphones and smart devices and smart thermostats and smart doorbells. So we're moving from dumb to smart. Before this decade's over, we're going to do smart to intelligent. So our homes will be intelligent. Our environments will be intelligent. So, so we're going to have companies that not just have technology, but live in intelligent environments. So how does that change work, right? I mean, it's almost beyond comprehension mm-hmm. because the intelligence in the room will create the intelligence of the room. And, and then you have all kinds of accelerations going on. Hmm. Um, and the, la- the other thing to say is that as we map the brain, we're going to have the final mapping of the brain in this decade. So as neuroscience fully maps the brain, um, it's going to lead to all new forms of computing, you know, parallel computing, quantum computing. So the Moore's law of doubling and halving and, ve- and cost every two years um, is going to be accelerated. So we're going to have an acceleration of computational capability year by year by year in this decade. So I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question, but all of that is going to affect business. Yeah, for sure. So you talk of a symbiotic merger of human brain and technological intelligence, which will scare the living hell out of a lot of people. Mm-hmm. How do you see that as a benefit for humanity? And how do we retain our humanness in that instance? That's a good question. Um, I think that um, what you have to think about is technology through the ages. One of the pieces of technology that historically has increased accelerated human learning and brain growth and IQ were eyeglasses. Because when people got eyeglasses, you know, 700 years ago for the first time, they could see and they didn't know that they couldn't see, they just realized they not bad at sight. Um, and, and they could read and maybe they couldn't read before. So a piece, so why would you not want somebody to see perfectly, right? Because it enhances them. Or, or the ability to record, or the ability to create by typing. Each of these are technological things that, that enhance human life. Um, transportation, electricity. And in each case, they've enhanced how we live. So think about Alzheimer's, for example, and the, or, or, you know, losing, getting Sina. <clears throat> By 20, end of 2023, more than likely, there'll be 
a chip, a memory chip that can be implanted in a brain that can capture the memory of the brain. So think technological solution to Alzheimer's. Well, wouldn't you rather have that than lose your memory and your sense of who you are? Or, um, you know, it, it, is, um, it is inevitable, you know, you can't stop technology. And the thing that people don't understand is like, for example, you today, Carmen, is the slowest rate of technological change for the rest of your life. It's only gonna get faster. So technology can't be slowed. And the other thing is technology is morally neutral. It's what humans do with it. You know, the Wright brothers created the plane. So it's shortened distances. And 16 years later in World War I, people were dropping bombs off of it, right? So, so technology is morally neutral. It's what we do with it. So um, can we do it to enhance humanity? Yeah, I mean, I've got an I've got a artificial hip, right? So would it, isn't it better to have that technology in my hip rather than to be in constant pain and have to use a, a cane all the time? So it's just by extension. Um, so I embrace it. My concern is to anticipate that it's coming so that we, humanity, get to choose on how it is utilized rather than it being done to us because we aren't paying attention. Yeah. So again, that awareness, like you're saying, and the shift to we and being actively involved so that we can build the ethics into it and, and it becomes an enhancement of life rather than a yeah. detraction from, right. from our humanness. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of, <clears throat> I mean, again, I was using eyeglasses because that's so simple, right? It, it's regarded as one of the great accelerants of IQ in human history for the obvious reason, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, uh, or, you know, I just was writing in the second book about, um, you know, the internet is the single greatest disintermediation agent of all time. It's disintermediated all kinds of businesses, as you well know. But the second thing that was created the greatest disintermediation was the movable type press in 1450, uh, Gutenberg, right? because it disintermediated knowledge outside the church. And, and it gave people a reason to read, which then accelerated knowledge and, and connected the world. So, you know, there are those moments of technological innovation that transform humanity. Um, and then there's other ones that we let get out of control and destroy us. You know, the atom bomb is the quintessential example. So, you know, really, that's why awareness, consciousness, and humanity, it's so, are also critically needed right now in the 2020s. Yeah, and through the media, we're fed only the negative side of all of these things, which brings about the fear. We're not really informed or made aware of the upside or even we're not even, our, our attention is never shifted to, well, there's always another side. And let's understand both sides and work together to, to create um, the best outcome for us. So we've shifted into to talking about evolution. Let's, let's move more into that. I, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. To create an exciting future for the next decade to work to the best it could be for all of us. To, for the greater good, and for us to avoid Armageddon. Can you comment on an individual, a business, and a macro level what we potentially need to eradicate and what we need to evolve? So like the, the, the big things that come to, to mind on each of those levels that would support us moving forward and securing a good future. So on the personal level, on the institutional but, level. Yes, and, and, the, and a, yes, yes. On the personal level, <clears throat> people need to, <clears throat> excuse me a sec, people need to be more open to change than they have been. They need to understand that change creates opportunity rather than something bad. 
you know, if the sun didn't come up, you wouldn't have a day, right? Um, so, uh, so on a personal level, be open to change, be open to new things, and to understand that when you stand in the present, in the now, that's where the future gets created. But if you're busy living in the past, or you're living through in a habituated consumptive life with no real awareness, the future will always be happening unto you. So by being aware and being in the moment, you stand in the moment to create change that is, improves your life and those around you. On the institutional side, it, 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 it's difficult because you have a grit, more of a mass. So how do you, how do you change something that's a larger and that's difficult and you know there have been all these kind of you know pseudo things like oh we need to be agile you know we're big but we need to act like we're small and you know all of that is language around the reality that it's hard to change an institution and so again the way i prompt institutions to change is if you're not busy changing someone's going to force you to change mm -hmm. and rarely when a business has to be totally reactive rather than proactive, is the script, does the, does the story turn out well, right? So uh, anticipate your markets, anticipate technologies, and try to, you know, you know the classic quote, but it's always worth saying, is Wayne, Wayne Gretzky, when asked why he was the greatest hockey player, he says, I skate to where the puck is going to be. So corporations need to go to where they think reality, their market, their industry is going rather than stand in, in the moment and say, hey, look how good we have been, right? Mm. And on a human level, it really has to be about under, what climate, the climate crisis is doing, Carmen, is that it is forcing us into making the decision, either change or long-term become extinct, right? You know, so, so it's kind of like, well, there's no doubt, but if, if we continue on the road we are on relative to climate, relative to fossil fuels, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, sea level rise, all that stuff, there will not be civilization as we know it by 2100. Now, a lot of people don't care, right? But the people who are most concerned about climate change, well, one of the groups that's most concerned about climate change are grandparents for the obvious reason, right? So, you know, if you don't have kids and you're all self-centered, you don't need to change. You'll just do what you want. But then you're not a space, you know, there are no passengers in Spaceship Earth, we're all crew. So for every person on Spaceship Earth who doesn't actively crew, that means those of us that choose to do so have to do it that much harder. So on a personal level, be open to change. On, a, on an institutional level, um, know that you have to constantly be changing and adapting. Mm -hmm. um, and on a global species level, um, you know, the, the great, we, we, have to, we have to embrace change. I mean, the quote, you know, I always go to rock and roll, right? You know, one of the great quotes of rock and roll that's always been in my life is Bob Dylan. Those not busy being born are busy dying. So that is the fork in the road. Corporations, are you busy being born? Or are you busy mm -hmm. dying? And in this case, it may, busy dying means standing in place or standing still or doing what you've always done. That's busy dying. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like that reference to the rock and roll quote. It it's, uh, kind of makes it quite clear as to what yeah. the picture is. Exactly. exactly. In other words, <laughs> In other words, you know, it, it is rock and roll. It's kind of punk. But um, what did I do today where I was busy being born? <laughs> and if I didn't do anything where I was busy being born, then I wasted a day. Right? I mean, I just decided, I mean, you know, if, if you take a day off to go to the beach and read a novel, well, you're busy being born in the sense that somehow you're lying fallow and you're not working. So when you go back to work, you be recharged and we call it recharging. That's valid, right? Doing nothing. I mean, there's no harm that has ever come to anyone in the world by sitting and doing nothing. 
it's it's what we do that causes damage, right? You know, you just sit under a tree all day, you're not gonna cause the earth any damage, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm sorry about that, but you know, it's true. Let's talk about some of your predictions, David. Sure. Um, what do you regard as one of maybe one one or two of the most disruptive predictions for 2021? For 2021? Yeah, if you have any, or if it's in the next well, year. Uh, the reality is that post COVID, the world will be significantly changed from pre COVID. So this stupidity of when we're gonna go back to normal, first of all, as you said, there is no normal. And so if there was no normal, we can't go back to someplace that wasn't. But what people are really saying is, I want this disruption gone. Yeah. I want to go back to something that I know every day is going to be pretty much the same. And the problem with that in the 2020s is you can't go back at all. So the metaphor I like to use, so the, the metaphor you've heard about, you know, COVID relative, certainly in the United States at least, is about, uh, well, we're all going to get vaccinated. So the light we're seeing, is it a train coming or is it the light at the end of the tunnel? Oh, it's gotta be the light at the end of the tunnel. But what, so I've been using that metaphor to say, you know, that the, the, the daylight that we left to enter the tunnel is different than the daylight we're gonna come out of the tunnel into. So that tunnel has changed reality while we've been in it, reality has changed. So uh, that's why the, the forecast or the prediction for this year is just that, is that the, the past has accelerated, is accelerating in the rear view mirror <laughs> because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And the workplace has changed. Uh, the concept of the office has changed. The concept of, of the screen reality has changed. The concept of almost everything has changed. In other words, all the entertainment and all the education stuff of the last century were you, you went to a classroom and somebody stood in front of you and talked, or you went to a movie theater and you watched a movie, both of those were shown to be invalid in a time of pandemic. And neither of them are going to come back to the way that they used to be. I mean, if there are 40,000 theaters, screens, excuse me, screens in the United States, movie screens in the United States in January 2020, there's probably going to be half of that by the end of 2021. They will exist, but they will have shrunk much more quickly because we've all been into streaming and everything else. So the, the interesting thing about this is that basically COVID is a year old. All the research of the last century, the latter part of the last century showed that you can create new habits in three weeks. So we've all created new habits. You know, I eat differently than I did before COVID. I approach TV differently than I did before COVID. My whole business is different because of COVID, right? So, so COVID is such a good metaphor. How, you, how much have you changed? And how much has your work environment changed? And is it good or bad? Don't relate it to what was, because what was is gone, right? It's like, oh, I wish I could go back to the third grade. Well, you can't. <laughs> you know? So, you know, you can't go back. Mm. And, and if you can't go back, if you can't go back home, if you can't go back to where you were, that prompts the necessity of change because you got to do something new. Hmm. So my forecast, sorry to go off on that. My forecast is that's what people are going to realize by the end of the year is that the world has changed and that's going to be a mirror. Are you changing with it? The other forecast is that, is that um, you know, the workplace is going to change you. I mean, I know you live in Mauritius, you live in a wonderful place, you know, but in, in the United States or in Europe, wherever you think of centers of commerce, like in London or Paris or Madrid or, or Berlin, 
they're going to have lots of vacancies, office vacancies. People aren't going back to the office. That's done. They will go back to the office, but maybe 50 to 70 percent of office time versus the way it was before COVID. And um, retail is going to continue to collapse physically because we buy stuff online or we're going to start buying less because of the climate crisis. Yes. Is there a potential for cost that you're aware of or something that's coming that could be a surprising, like a, 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 you know, one of these amazing surprises that people go, oh, wow, this is a massive change, but such an incredible change that they would embrace it. Is there anything of that sort that comes to mind? Well, you kind of start with technological examples. You know, mm -hmm. it's not that technology is the future, it's how technology changes human behavior, yes. right? So I'm of an age where I go to doctors a lot, right? And whenever you go to a doctor, I don't know if it's the same where you are, but you sit down and you're given a clipboard to fill out your health information, right? So every time you go to a doctor's office, well, here's this clipboard, here's your insurance information or, you know, what have you had in the past? And it's just kind of like, why? You know, just give me a little half inch by half inch chip, put it into my wrist and it has all my medical data. So I just go into a doctor's office, they scan my wrist. I don't need to fill it up. But more significantly, you know, let's say you're taking a trip, you know, and you're in Africa and you have an accident and you're unconscious. They don't know that you're not allergic to something. They don't know that you've got an artifice or whatever, but your chip tells them. So you may be unconscious and your chip will save your life, right? So that, so embedded chips for, with all your medical records, embedded chips to replace the phone, embedded chips, as I said, to solve Alzheimer's. So, so the embedding of chips in the brain and the connecting of the brain to external technology so that your thoughts can go up into the cloud sounds really weird. That's definitely going to happen by 2025. Wow, so that's not far off. Right. And, and the other thing is, you know, if you've had smartphones for a decade, you get a new one every two or three years and there's all these new features but you never use all the features that you have, right? You just don't, right? So it's kind of the changes they're bringing are iterative changes, they're innovative changes. But the next disruption I think is gonna be where I have this phone and, I, and rather than just me being on a video on a screen, on two dimension, it'll be, if you will, a holograph, a hologram. So my hologram can show up in a boardroom and it'll have a sense of presence and I won't be there. So, so how we communicate and, and how we manage our data will change mm. dramatically. Mm. How far are we from something like a hologram? Um, on a handheld device, probably five years. Oh. Um, right now, uh, you know, it's my job to research stuff. Mm -hmm. Right now, there are there is a very low level technology, where think large technology enhanced phone booth, in one place, and in another place, and holograms can go back and forth. So it already exists in terms of a very crude technology, just like the mainframe computer was a crude technology, right? And and how fast that accelerates. I mean, it'll be, I think it'll be five years. Wow. It, it, may be, it, may be, it may be seven or eight years till, you know, um, a billion people have this device, you know, because stuff comes out and it's really expensive and then it goes mm. down in cost. Mm. So. so what the last hour has proven, David, is that we certainly are already in the most disruptive decade in yeah. history. Um, right. And it is going to continuously disrupt. We'll have m multiple volcanic eruptions um, <laughs> over, over the next um, right. 10 or so years. And the key thing that's coming through for me is actually to become aware, to become interested, become aware, because there's more to this change than just the scary stuff. 
there's actually so much that is surprisingly good and beneficial for us, but we've got to, as a collective, we've got to be interested enough to be part of it. So right. ha you having done so many different things and being in two vastly different industries, if you go back and, and, and consider your many successes, what would you say is your most cherished success to date? Um, in keeping with the theme of this, it has to be personal in the sense that, <clears throat> you know, this is my story, but, but it, it really in a deep way answers your question. When I graduated from college, I was a hippie <laughs> was a long time ago. And I, my degree was in art history. And shortly after graduation, you know, speaking to my parents' generation at the time, I realized that the, <clears throat> sorry, the following question I was gonna get asked a lot, which is, so what are you gonna do with an art history degree? <clears throat> So I realized I had to come up with an answer to that because I was getting asked a lot. <clears throat> and also I had an attitude about it, like, screw you. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't get a business degree, an accounting degree, you know. So I said, Carmen, I said, How, what am I going to do with an art history degree? Two things, sir. Two things, ma'am. I am going to live my life at a higher aesthetic level than most people. And I have definitely done that. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, and this was kind of being a punk, I said, I'm going to make my life a work of art. So now in my 70s, as I am writing a lot and reflecting, looking back, and people like you are asking me questions like this, you know, the wisdom that comes up for me is that I have, right? Mm -hmm. I lived in a van, I backpacked around the world, I've been in 56 countries, I helped launch MTV, I've been to Burning Man, I've spoken to Burning Man, I've run with the Bulls in Pamplona, I've, I've, I've written lots of books, I've had lots of love in my life, um, you know, so, so I didn't wake up too late and kind of go, what am I doing with my life? You know, it was live at the beginning. So I think the single greatest thing I can say is, when I look back on the life, it was a life relatively well lived. Now that doesn't mean I have all kinds of regrets and I didn't hurt people and I didn't make really stupid mistakes, but that's the human nature of, mm. of change, right? Yes. You can't change and always change for the bad. You can't make decisions that have them always be right. But if you're always making decisions and you're always trying to change, that's a life well led. So I think the answer is, you know, for an aesthetic statement, I've made my life a work of art. I mean, that sounds kind of arrogant, but in a way it's really pretty, right? <laughs> this, the ultimate creation is one's life. So I, 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 I spend the last part of my life in legacy work and trying to elevate the world. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm thrilled that, to have such an intelligent podcast to be a part of that, that you know, maybe this will go out and somebody will hear it and they'll change their life. And who knows how that life change may affect something down the line. So it's, it's all this kinetic, uh, you know, exponential possibilities. So that's what I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to take what I have learned and what I see and my highest value and do that every day. Wow. And, and you've done such an incredible um, job of that. I mean, what a, how beautiful to see it as this work of art. And well, this, I, yeah. I mean, the metaphor is, think of that, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful masterpiece that's const constantly in uh, being reinvented as you go into decade by decade. And thank you for, for having that mission for your life because you've been able to bring us these incredible concepts. What I, I take away from this hour is such a, a much more balanced view um, of, of the future. Which, which allows me not to be fearful, but to also approach it very differently when it's so much more balanced. So thank you for that. Well, you made, me, you made my day, you know, thank you. <laughs> thank you. The thing you have to do is put this message out and, 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 and incorporate whatever, if, what I'm saying, the, who you are and put it out into the world because this is the time. We don't, 
we don't have the luxury of, mm -hmm. of endless reflection. Yes, exactly. Last message, David, if you could share a message from your heart with the world, what message would you want to share? Be really conscious as much as you can. And in that conscious awareness, try to really grasp what is affecting you. What is your inputs? Because if you have bad inputs, time to change your inputs. Because we all, everything's energy. So how much bad energy is coming into your life versus good energy? You know, we talked about love and fear. You know, and, and there are these kind of dualities that keep coming up for humanity. So, so try, to, try to always go to the brighter side. Try to go to the creative side. Try to go to the side that is self-reaffirming rather than, than self-rejection. And, and, and understand that we all have that struggle every day. And to try to be your better self, whatever that may be. Try to be your happier self. You know, what is it that brings you happiness? And whatever brings you happiness is probably a direction you want to go in. So be conscious, be aware. Um, you know, the, the Dalai Lama had a great description of how to live a spiritual life. He said, uh, be happy and treat everyone like a friend. Beautiful, be happy, treat everyone as a, as a friend. Thank you. It's hard to do. <laughs> it, it is, it is, but it's possible. It's right. absolutely possible if we open our mind. And as I always say to all the guests on, on my show, is um, we may have started out as strangers, but once you've been on the show, you're a friend of mine for life. And um, so I, I share that, that sentiment. Thank you for being here with us, David, and thank you for sharing all these amazing elements of you and, and, and various like a tapestry that you've put together over the years and, and infused yourself into this masterpiece. So thank you for sharing this with us and making us less fearful and, and kind of shaking the tree a little bit in terms of, well, get, get away, become aware, because it can actually be one hell of an amazing ride if we make it so. So um, yes. thank you so much for that. And wishing you just only the best and lots and lots and lots of love and maybe even a bit more hippiness um, if that's <laughs> going to bring some art. <laughs> exactly. Namaste. Namaste. And to all of you watching and um, listening from wherever you are, if every single one of us were to make a choice to play a more conscious role in shaping our future, and more of us were to tap much, much more deeply into our human qualities and, and this power of, of, of actively connecting, collaborating, co-creating and realizing where are we, then surely we will be able to come up with solutions for the greater good and it won't be Armageddon, but we will be able to write a new business story and a new human story and a future we promise. Till next time, lots of love.